Live from New York, it's theCUBE. Covering Big Data New York City 2016. Brought to you by headline sponsors, Cisco, IBM, NVIDIA, and our ecosystem sponsors. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. Welcome back to New York City, everybody. This is Women in Tech Wednesday here at uh, Big Data NYC. We do Big Data NYC every year, uh, concurrent with O'Reilly, Strata, plus Hadoop World. It's Big Data Week in New York. We go all week. We started Monday with an evening on deep learning and AI, uh, co-sponsored by NVIDIA. We had a party that night. Last night, we had really an awesome afternoon. We did all day CUBE interviews, and then we did uh, a segment really focusing on uh, machine learning and applying analytics and, and uh, cognitive. Uh, IBM came uh, on theCUBE prior to their big announcement last night, we'll talk about that in a second. And then we hosted a panel of eight data scientists, rock star data scientists talking about things like, you know, is there such a thing as a citizen data scientist? How should application development and data science teams work together? What is a data scientist? And then after that, we went over and, and listened to Bob Picciano and his team, Ritika Gunn and others at IBM announce their new platform for cognitive analytics really trying to simplify and up-level the complexities of, uh, of, of doing sort of big data analytics. And then of course IBM had a big party. You know, Jeff Frick, my co-host is here with me. We were on the ground interviewing people at the party, uh, data scientists, practitioners, executives. It was good, good night. Yeah, it was a great night. And, and uh, you know, we continue to try to innovate Dave and theCUBE and, and to have that round table, eight people up on the set. I was kind of, it's fun to see all the faces that, that match the Twitter handles that we see all the time. A lot of big influencers. You know, the only thing we didn't really cover, and I was trying to get you a question in there, is, is kind of, what about, it's still kind of the, how to lie with statistics, right? You know, you can pretty much always find a number to support your hypothesis, and we really didn't get too much into that. We did get into, you know, if, if you've got a, a result that just looks too good to be true, you need to go back and check. But a, a lot of other things came out of it that I thought were good, especially on Women in Tech Wednesday, we had 25% of the, of the folks on the panel were women, but talking about the softer skills, that um, one of the panelists said we used to never come up in kind of a data science conversation. You need to have softer skills to have a broader kind of experience base in which to build your, your algorithms and test your algorithms, which I thought was pretty interesting. The other concept that keeps coming up over and over and over again is this concept of a data scientist. Is it a unicorn? And I think um, it was Craig Brown brought up that really the way to think about it, it's a team sport. It's like nothing else in business. You know, you need people that have different skill sets that they can bring to the table. So I thought that was, was a pretty interesting play, and, and I thought the round table worked out pretty well, which we've never done before on the Yeah, Cube. it worked out great. <clears throat> Afterwards, we were talking to, so this, it was interesting, there were, there were two out of the eight panel members were women, it just happened to be 25%, which was the number I threw out about the percent of C chief data officers that happened to be women. Um, I don't know if that's the right number or not, but it was just sort of a coincidence, but we were talking to both the women on the panel, Miriam uh, Friedel, who's with Elder Research, does some really interesting high-end stuff, and, and Jennifer Shin, who works for Nielsen. We were talking to them a afterwards at the party along with Des Blanchfield, and what they were saying to uh, uh, Peter and myself, Peter Burris, is they, when they go to build models, they assume that the data is not going to be there. So Jennifer right now was doing some stuff with uh, electronic medical records and trying to you know, predict you know, cause and effect of, of, of you know, health incidents and, and likelihood of certain diseases. And so, so they go into building these models with the assumption that the data is not going to be there because they're real skeptics. And then the other thing, somebody said they had the great line the other day, if you torture data long enough, you know, it'll, it'll give you the answer, right? And so they just, one of the aspects of being a data scientist is really not giving up on the data, keep looking at it from different angles. And so it was quite instructive, I thought, that, that panel. So, um, so today, we got a big day today, you know, more wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Right, I know we right. did 10, 12, 15 interviews yesterday. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, one of the other big themes is this whole Hadoop ecosystem is really shifting. We used to spend all the time talking about Cloudera, MapR, and, and Hortonworks, and those guys are sort of like infrastructure plumbing. Right, um, right. And, <clears throat> and we had a big discussion yesterday about the cloud guys trying to go sort of create an abstraction layer above their sets of services, and in many respects, creating threats to guys like you know, Cloudera, because you know, generally Cloudera and Hortonworks, and we'll explore this today with some of the folks from, from Hortonworks, do a lot of on-prem stuff. You know, they're betting on hybrid cloud. And you know, pure cloud is going to be an interesting 
dynamic for those guys to compete specifically with Amazon and, and Microsoft. I mean, they will participate in those solutions in the marketplaces, you know, but increasingly, customers are going to consume those uh, 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 capabilities as services to right. Amazon and others. The, the, the other kind of theme that keeps coming over and over and over is before big data kind of equal to dupe. Um, and, right. and there were big data shows, and it was Hadoop World and Hadoop Summit, and we're hearing more and more that Hadoop is kind of a generic term now, almost for the ecosystem around big data. And I thought what was really interesting, part of Picciano's thing last night, is he said, you know, IBM is going to innovate at the speed of open source. And we hear over and over and over at DockerCon and all these different open source shows that you just can't compete with an engaged community on speed of innovation. And so for, for Bob to call out um, specifically and then bring up all the open source projects that they're really actively involved with, and I think it came up in one of the interviews yesterday, they're the number one contributor, or I might be mi mixing it up for the Spark project. Um, it really shows a bold move and kind of changing the whole narrative around big data as Hadoop to big data and analytics, and again, building off the, the NVIDIA panels we had the night before, is, is a much bigger play than just Hadoop. Yeah, I don't know what that actual number, so we heard two different sort of quasi-conflicting stats yesterday. One of the IBM folks said we're number two contributed to Spark, and then twice we heard, I think from Ritika, and I heard it again yesterday from uh, uh, Bob Picciano at the announcement that they were number one, <clears throat> but I think IBM is number one in contributions around machine learning or something like that. Number two, maybe overall, who knows, we'll try to unpack that. It really doesn't matter. They're pu putting a lot of resources into Spark, and, and you know, it's, it's interesting, Jeff, I mean, Hadoop, we talk about all the time, and Rob Hof just wrote an excellent article on you know, the Hadoop, you know, big data hasn't lived up to its promises on siliconangle.com. We talk all the time about the complexity and the barriers of absorbing, and you heard some of the guests yesterday say, well, we're not experiencing that, and you know, of course the vendor view versus the practitioner view is sometimes you know, not aligned. Nonetheless, when Spark came to four, what we saw is a lot of people said, okay, I couldn't deal with Hadoop complexity, I'm going to replace or, or supplant a lot of the things that I'm doing with, or, or had intended to do with Hadoop with Spark, because it's more integrated, it's simpler for us to use, and I'm going to, I'm going to go pure Spark. Now, if people have investment in Hadoop, they've got to obviously get a return on that asset, so they're going to continue, and likely they have the skill sets. Um, but there's no question that this bespoke sort of Hadoop movement has spawned a lot of innovation, uh, but it's, it's been a challenge for practitioners to bring all that together and actually you know, deliver value. Right. So that's something that we've been tracking and watching, and I, I suspect, you know, we haven't heard the end of this. You know, Spark is not the end of the road. When you talk to people who come out of you know, Google and, and other places that are early adopters of, of sort of big data technologies, they said years ago, oh, Alaska, uh, uh, MapReduce, long gone. We're not doing that anymore. Hadoop, uh, yeah, do we use it a little bit, but we've moved on. You know, and you, you talk to people now, they say, yeah, in memory, Spark, yeah, we did that, but there's other stuff going on. So, right. you know how it is. When it happens in the hyperscale guys, five years later, it hits the enterprise. Right, and uh, Armand Ruiz from IBM, you know, talked about this project, their data science experience. Because there's so much open source going on all the time, there's so much development, and, and he called it, you know, Facebook for data scientists, which I thought was pretty funny. It's a place to bring together, as we talk about all the time, content and community and engagement, so they can accelerate their learning. Because how do, if you're a data scientist, how do you keep up with all this stuff and get your day job done? Uh, and be a contributor. So it's a, it's a really exciting time, a challenging time, a lot of dynamic pieces in play. I, IBM, um, again, <clears throat> had made an announcement yesterday, they call it DataWorks, and their whole thrust was we're going to try to simplify, we are simplifying the complexity of doing analytics, and we're bringing Wat Watson to bear. And they gave a demo, it was actually a pretty good demo of you know, somebody who, who went on a website, they wanted to, go, wanted to go camping, where do you typically go camping, you know, Acadia, you know, family, how many people, blah, blah, blah. You answer a bunch of questions like a wizard. And then it, you know, suggested, okay, these are the tents, this is the equipment you need. They brought up an offer, like 10% off, you know, this From whatever gas stove or whatever it was. <laughs> and I was impressed at a couple of things. First of all, you know, they're doing this with a line of code. Doing some basic visualization. I think, you know, Peter Burris made the comment that the, the viz was not totally where it should be. And I would agree with that. I think there's some work to be done in visualization, but I'm, uh, I'm assuming that they can integrate with other visualization tools like Tableau and Click and others. Uh, but nonetheless, the speed with which they were able to configure that, those, those answers and present those answers to the, to the consumer was lightning fast. 
it looked like it was really simple to code, you know, single line of code, you know, to, to create functions that used to take hundreds of lines of code. Um, and like I said, lightning fast. I think of those, you know, you go to the, the wine websites and they're very rudimentary and you know, you, okay, you want red or white, cab or da, da, da. And you sort of do these pull downs and it sort of chunk, 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 chunk and then spits out a bunch of wines. You know, it looks like we're now entering the next generation of consumer sort of friendly, you know, assistance in terms of buying. So that's one example, you know, it's a, it's a classic retail example, but there potentially are many, many others in healthcare and finance and fraud detection and, you know, the list is endless. And so the big question is, can IBM simplify that in software to the extent that you don't have to use, you know, expensive IBM services to pull this stuff off? And now that's been IBM's business model for years, is lead with services to minimize the complexity, pay us, we'll do it for you but that's not a great scale model. And I think IBM is really trying to drive scale through software. Right, and then there's a whole nother level that came up in the panel last night, which is why are you doing it all in a drop-down menu? Eventually you'll be, you'll be asking, right? You'll be asking the computer, computer like you do now for directions um, with a natural language. So the whole natural language piece of it still has a long way to go. And then again, to build in all these inferences, to build in, you know, I think the example came up, you know, what are my sales looking like this month? You know, what are my sales going to look like next year? And to take that type of a, a verbal trigger into the, into the compute is going to be, you know, the, the future is, is going to be crazy. Yeah, so today we'll be uh, uh, having a lot of guests from the, the, the big data ecosystem, both the Hadoop and Spark ecosystems, uh, some of the management vendors, we got some uh, uh, other folks coming on, the technologists are coming on, maybe talking about some of the big picture trends that we've touched on here you know, the future of big data, the viability of, of the business. So we're going to have some interesting uh, discussions throughout the day. We're going to be here all day today. Wednesday, we'll be here as well. On Thursday, we're at 37 Pillars on 37th Street. I think it's 514 37th Street. Just, you know, it's a John Furrier driver from Javits <laughs> Center. Uh, just up 37th Street, stop by. We got signs out, you know, say hello. And uh, Jeff and I and Peter Burris and George Gilbert will be going all day long, so, um, Appreciate your attention, appreciate you guys watching. You know, you can tweet us, I'm at DVellante, uh, at theCUBE, check out theCUBE gems, check out siliconangle.tv for all the videos. John Furrier is actually down at splunk.conf uh, this week. He's covering that with John Wall, so we got that event going on, and, uh, and we'll, we'll share with you where theCUBE is going to be next. So, you know, really appreciate you guys watching. Uh, keep it right there, we'll be back with our next guest right after this short break. <laughs>